All right. Hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from San Diego. A little bit cloudy today, actually. But I'm joined also by Juliana Stan Campiano, who is up in Seattle. Hopefully your skies are a little less cloudy up there. You know, it's been really nice here, so don't tell anybody, but it is a little cloudy today. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been beautiful sunshine here for the last while, so a few clouds aren't going to hurt us. Of course, us. right. So Juliana, Juliana is an author, business leader, and strategist focused on helping business leaders and their teams modernize workplace education, and you're the CEO of Oxygen. And what we're going to talk today about is customer-facing roles and the, the power of teams and Juliana also wrote the uh, the book Radical Outcomes: <clears throat> How to Create Extraordinary Teams to Get Tangible Results. So, I mean, the first thing is Juliana, when you talk about um, customer facing roles, because I think sometimes people don't really think that their roles are customer facing when they actually are. So, what when you talk yeah. about customer facing roles, what do you mean? Yeah, when we think about it, we think about anybody that's doing something that's going to touch a customer, mm -hmm. which typically includes a lot of roles in, in house, right? Um, internal. Yeah. Um, the ones that I think are the most primarily noted are marketing, sales, and service. Um, and I, I kind of love that those three are being bundled together lately because it is the end-to-end -end view from a customer perspective of what they see about your company, right? They see the things that marketing puts out if they don't know about you. And then they potentially engage in some sort of marketing effort, whether it's a podcast or a webinar, or, you know, something that your company is putting out. Um, and then that hopefully for them will lead into, you know, a lead into the pipeline for a salesperson that's going to contact you, you know, working through that sales cycle. Should you become a customer, then potentially you end up using or interfacing with their services which um, I think sometimes has a negative connotation if you need to, mm -hmm. you know, help from the services, but I think can also be a positive after sale um, interface with just explanations on the, whatever it is that you've got mm -hmm. and how to use it more effectively, you know, and, and answering questions and things like that post. So I kind of look at amongst that continuum today, knowing that, you know, engineering or product development in those areas also are customer facing, but we think about those people that really um, interact, you know, face to face with customers. Yeah, and a lot of times you find with marketing people though that uh, if they're not directly face to face interacting with customers, they sometimes don't think that they have a customer facing role. Yet, as you point out, everything that they're putting out is for customers to look at or interact with. So they do; they are customer facing and I think sometimes it, it it would help if they looked at it that way okay I might not, may not be on the phone or on zoom with the actual customer but everything I'm putting out and everything I'm looking for them to engage with is is what I is an engagement is a customer facing role yeah you know I think that for anybody that can sometimes be a hard connection to make when you aren't doing that role right sitting in front mm -hmm. of somebody on a virtual call or um, physically engaging with them. And I think that that's where personas were born out of, right? Which a lot of, you know, companies use to base what they're going to create. And what we've done a lot of lately or looked at is how do we use actual people? And like, let's make this feel more real about this person that you're engaging with versus um, even just a persona or, you know, a mock-up of somebody. How do you you know, bring that to life. And we, ha we all have interactions on a day-to-day -day basis of marketing stuff coming at us. Right. And so mm -hmm. if we relate to that, I think it's easier to, to have that connection with what it is that you're doing. Yeah. So, and um, so then how do you, how do you start to bring these teams together? Cause you talked about marketing sales and, and customer service. And obviously in a lot of companies, they tend to exist in somewhat of a siloed, um, environment how do you have them work together because at the end of the day what you want is your customer to have a kind of uniform experience and be delighted at every stage of the process not have like a great you know have uh, great promises made by marketing and then have well a good sales experience but then the after sales service isn't so good or later on when you interact uh, it's hard to get in contact with people or whatever it is but how do you help people realize that it has to be an end-to-end -end experience yeah, I think um, it's such a great question. And 
I'm not going to say that it's easy because mm-hmm. it's not right. And I also think that maybe a silo doesn't necessarily have a place, but that organization needs to be an organization. Marketing needs to be mm-hmm. an organization. Sales needs to be an organization. They're very focused on what it is that they do and being extremely good at that, um, you know, that role mm-hmm. within the company. But I think that what is helpful is finding the inflection points where we cross over and need to work together um, and understanding that. And so when you can create small groups that work together to say, and and this is marketing to sales and sales to services, Mm -hmm. right? Like I've heard so many, you know, sales to services problems as well. It's like, oh, if only our seller would bring us in, you know, earlier on in the cycle. And that's basically what everybody's constantly saying. Mm-hmm. If I was just brought in, if, if sales was just brought in earlier in the marketing process, um, I could help. And so I think, you know, it's it's listening to those audiences and understanding what they're hearing from the customer, because they're all customer facing about what mm-hmm. their needs are in order to inform whatever it is that they create. Because creating something in marketing without having input from sales typically creates stuff that, you know, to your point, um, marketing gets upset, right? When they're like, well, we created this and now sales can't sell it. And it's like, well, I can't sell it because of X, Y, and Z. And then the services people are like, yeah, and then you put us in a bad position because we can't service or deliver on the promise, right? So it's it's just a continuum. And sometimes I think that we don't always um, want to hear exactly what the customer wants necessarily. Mm-hmm. We want to create the thing that we're really excited about. And so... Sometimes we have to, you know, and and even as a business owner myself, sometimes we have to ratchet down our expectations. Um, And that isn't always very fun to do. (laughs) And so, you know, kind of bringing that insight and saying, I know this isn't exactly what we would like to be selling, but it's where our customer is at and what they need. And let's talk about how we take them from here to, you know, where we would like to go with them. And let's create that journey for them versus trying to, you know, get them somewhere that they're not ready to be at and have some success. Yeah. And I think that also goes for, um, you know, how the experience the customer has and how they want to interact with you. Because I think we went through this phase a while back when technology became, you know, more invasive is where we built as many walls and barriers as we could between the customer and people. And uh, and we've seen many, many um, uh, instances of that. Um, but I think that, you know, customer service and everything has such a huge role today because people want to have, you know, they want to be listened to, they want to interact with somebody. And let's face it, a lot of products and services are pretty commoditized. So when you buy something, you pretty much expect it to do what it says on the packet, right? Where the difference comes in is the experience that you have, but also when you have a, a service issue or whatever, that experience can either make you a huge fan or, you know, want to swap the product. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I think, you know, most companies know that or seeing that and, you know, some of the larger companies are shifting. Um, Microsoft just made a large announcement of, you know, renaming and uh, a lot of their roles on the services side and reorganizing their services organization to be customer success oriented. And right. I think that that goes exactly to what you're talking about of um, they are seeing that the services can make or break the customer experience. And, you know, I think we're all in this time with COVID and the shift in the environment around us Mm -hmm. and what we've seen. And I think a lot of companies have seen, and we hear a lot about, but it's like doubling down even more so right now around those customers that you already have, right? Because that is where, you know, if they're in an industry that's doing well, that's where the growth is. They're in an industry that's not doing well, just being there and kind of helping and supporting them and doing what you can, because eventually things will start to change again. I don't know what direction, (laughs) because I don't think we're going back to anything, you know, anything that we, we knew, but I do believe that these industries, hotels, the airlines, et cetera, you know, they're going to keep going and they're, they're changing as well. Restaurants are changing, man, the amount of, you know, online ordering that you can now do and Mm -hmm. QR codes that you can zap when you're sitting at a table. So it's a touchless, um, you know, experience, like all those things are shifting. And so how do we walk through that with our clients and be there um, when they're, you know, again, successful and like growing? Yeah. And I think it's, it's such an interesting balance going forward as well, making everything 
convenient and leveraging technology at the same time having you know humanizing it as well so having that combination of convenience and speed but also feeling like you have there is some kind of human connection yeah i think we're in the midst of like that swirl right now mm-hmm. I, I don't know about you but like i've been out yeah. sometimes where i'm like wow i didn't talk to anybody like this yeah. is kind of a weird experience like i kind of wanted to talk to somebody you know yeah, yeah. Um, along that continuum and then you know the flip side would be talking to people too much which we've seen happen yeah. uh, you know as well uh, around the world and in my mind ex- at least where seattle's at we're like whoa 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 like don't get too <laughs> close you know um, so it's just we're all managing i think and navigating that in many different ways right now so as you um, i mean you work with organizations sometimes like to build this whole thing and even advise on uh, hiring and onboarding and that is what you know going forward what do you see are the skills that people really need to succeed in any customer facing role yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, the one that I k- keep coming back to, and I would say is maybe a little bit overused right now um, in general, but and and it's not necessarily um, for the person, but it's having empathy for your audience. Mm-hmm. Right. So continuously trying to put yourself in the shoes of that other person and what they're working on. And I think that goes across all these customer facing roles and kind of gets back to your question about how to team together. And I think, you know, if a seller can walk up to a marketer and say, help me understand what it is that you're doing because I'm struggling to get some value or whatever, right? Or I can't use this in front of my customer and I don't know how to have the conversation with you. And I'm trying to understand where you're coming from and that's hard for me. So can mm-hmm. you just give me, give me a five, 10 minute overview And let me try to understand where you're at so that I can then um, potentially help it help translate in that in my mind so that we can work together and I can get what I need and you can do what you need. Because what I've found a lot of times is some of this comes down to like the performance management side of a business and kind of that, how that is run in a business will impact how somebody acts or what they do. Uh, and I've been on so many calls and listened into so many where you hear the marketing person going, yes, you need a this or you need a that. And I'm going to, you know, I'm creating this or, or that. And it's like, wait, you're not actually listening to the conversation they're going to be having. You're just trying to tell them what the answer is. And so sometimes we just have to back up a little bit, slow down um, and ask some curious questions so that we can then team and collaborate together. Because I do believe that in the pace that we're in today and mm-hmm. how things are moving, we can't do it alone. Yeah. And yeah. we can't do a customer you know, experience <laughs> alone either. It'll be a Herculean effort if it is, and we'll burn out. Yeah. So we I have to figure that out. Yeah, I, I love the point here because we, we, as you say, yeah, we talk about empathy a lot, but we talk about empathy mainly in like putting yourselves in the shoes of the customer, the prospect, yes. et cetera. But rarely do we talk about it inter- internally in sort of like sales, putting themselves in the shoes of marketing, marketing, putting themselves in the shoes of sales, et cetera. And I think that is, that is some way I think could be very transformational for an organization if they start to you know, really reinforce and preach internal empathy as opposed to just external empathy. I totally agree. And I think that comes down to just empathy sometimes for the team that you're on. I've I've seen it in my own teams where sometimes I'll stop and say, I believe that so-and-so, and and like, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm going to try to articulate Mm -hmm. what I see happening here is pushing for that because there's this deadline that you probably don't know about that's coming up. And she believes that if we don't have X and Y by that deadline, then we're going to be behind. Is that accurate? And the person goes, yes. And you're like, okay. And then the other person goes, oh, okay. Well, yeah, I'll give you what you need right now so that we can hit that. And then can we address the thing that I'm pushing you for? Mm-hmm. You know, and it, and it's sometimes articulating those things out loud to a team is what pushes you to see it from the other person's point of view. And typically I find they're really small things and shifts yeah. that are needed. It's nothing big, you know, it's, it's the little things that kind of accumulate through time and then it becomes a big thing. And so how yeah. do we break that down into the little things so that we don't have to deal with these really big, um, you know, kind of impasses that we get to. 
Yeah, and I like that idea of like articulating things out loud because otherwise we tend to make a lot of assumptions. Uh, <laughs> and you know, we assume something about sales or we assume something about marketing or or about this person or about that project or whatever. Um, and we're always told to ask questions, but sometimes we forget to. And as you say, we don't articulate things out loud and we just make assumptions, which then leads to issues later on. Yeah, and I think you know the one thing that I try to keep in mind is if I leave a meeting and I'm like, oh, I didn't, I don't know that I understand why so and so said X. Like, I immediately reach out to that person and go, Hey, I know we just got off the call, but I just realized like I don't understand X or Y, you know. And, and we try to do this as a team because you shouldn't leave a meeting and still have those questions, right? Yeah. Or, or if somebody yeah. pings you and says, Hey, I didn't understand this thing. Did you, can you, and, and then that's where those like triangles start, right? Yeah, and yeah. You're interpreting it for the other person. It's like, let's jump back on the call and let's ask the question. Like, let's not leave and not have these questions not answered. Yeah, exactly. It's like when somebody says, does that make sense? And everybody goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and half the people are like in, internally going, I've no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> but they've just yeah, said yes you to gotta it. Be that, so, yeah. yeah, you have to be that person that's like, nope, not for me. And you're like, okay, yeah. great. Like, let's back this uh, up. Know, and the, and the great thing about that is that if you've been in meetings where you've almost seen like, you know, when everybody says, does that make sense to everybody? And, and most people are nodding. And then one person goes, um actually no i don't really understand it and then you can see the relief on the faces of other people who are like yeah i I didn't really understand it either yeah so i think that whole thing of like being you know openly communicating is is something that um i mean it's it's something that is so powerful but you have to create the organization though don't you where that's acceptable yes the culture and the environment has to feel safe for somebody to say i didn't get that yeah, like help yeah. help me understand that and what am i missing you know to understand it and you're the interesting thing is i think you're right that probably you know 90% of the time others didn't understand either and so that's a real issue from an organizational standpoint if that's happening because you have a lot of people not asking questions and clarifying yeah. so that the work can get done and then, I mean, a part of it also is human nature, where, they're, where we're so intent on getting to the solution, like, let's start building, let's start doing whatever it is without sort of saying, actually, I probably need to ask a few more clarifying questions. And that's when we come with missed expectations or somebody coming back with something and they're going, well, that's not quite what I was looking for. So I do think that people need to get into a habit of, of being more questioning and validating more their understanding of things. Because I think then that translates as we're talking about customer facing, because let's face it, if you have internal commu- communication confusion, what does that mean for the customer? Yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah. They're getting the same thing, right? They're yeah. Not so they're going to get one message from you. They're going to get one message from me and they're going to be, huh? <laughs> Yeah. And, you know, think about that when, if there's alignment between all those different areas that they're like, whoa, those people are on the same talk track. Like that's uh, on. <laughs> yeah. And that's, yeah, that's seriously. I mean, that's on. Yeah. And there you, there you go. There's a great point of, uh, if people are looking today, they're always looking for points of differentiation in a world that's highly commoditized. One of the great ways is that if, yeah. if people have a uniform experience and just as you said, if they kind of hear the same thing from everybody, then they, as you said, they'll go, mm, this organization really has their stuff together. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, this has been great, Juliana. Um, all of Juliana's information will be in the contributor bio uh, b- below this uh, video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about yourself, your company and what you do. Yeah, Oxygen um, has been around since 2008. I started it here in Seattle. We've been entrenched in doing consulting services for sales enablement and learning organizations, as well as developing experiences of all sorts, as you said earlier, from onboarding to ongoing you know, development, performance management, et cetera, um, and then a lot of creative services on top of that. So kind of a full mm-hmm. service firm in the sales enablement and learning space. And just one last question that just struck me before we go. Now that there's a lot more people um, working remotely or, or virtually, what, what kind of challenges does that raise for a company like yours in terms of helping organizations recruit and onboard people who are no longer going to necessarily be in an office? You know, I think the biggest challenge right now is how do you build the trust virtually? And, um, and trust to me is something that is a very big thing, but actually Mm -hmm. comes down to very micro 
actions that happen and how do we intentionally build that in now to the onboarding, the hiring process, like all of those things um, and be very intentional about how we do it. Because before I think when you saw people and you're interacting, it happened through time and we didn't have to think about it quite as much. And now we have to think about how to build that in. And we're, I'm doing it in my own organization as well, where we've hired people and, you know, it's, it's just different for whatever mm-hmm. reason, it is just different. And so as a leader, I'm trying to ha- I'm having to be much more intentional about setting the time and making that time specific for um, just getting to know one another and asking questions and, you know, and having external people come in and help us because there is something about having an external person facilitate something for you that makes a difference of the conversation and where people are at. Um, And I think making space for people. So making the time for them to be able to have those conversations, because I think a lot of us are on constant calls since we've been at home, it's been much more back-to-back business calls. And so we've been freeing up time to just connect and talk about what's going on outside of just the work environment. And so, you know, we have to be a lot more intentional right now. Yeah, no, I love that. I love that word intentional. And I think that's a great takeaway for people as well is um, that it can work really well. We've worked, uh, we've strategically decided to have a largely virtual organization about six years ago. Mm-hmm. And it's worked fantastically for us. But to your point, you have to be intentional on in the way you go about it. All right. Absolutely. Well, my name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine, Pipeline of CRM. See you off for another interview really soon. Thanks again, Juliana, and uh, have a great rest of your day. Yeah, thanks so much, John. 